particularly young people, are more and more saying, I know there's government, I know there's charity, but what can I do with my own life? You know, and people are looking at them, you know, whether they fly, the food they buy, the clothes they buy, looking at all those issues. And it really struck me that your financial footprint could be the biggest thing that affects your carbon footprint. Hi, my name is Philippa Nuttall, Environment and Sustainability Editor at The New Statesman. Today, I'm interviewing Richard Curtis, who is best known to most people as director of films such as Love Actually and the Bridget Jones Diary series. How's your love life? How's your love life? However, he also has a second parallel career as an environmental and social campaigner, most notably setting up Red Nose Day and Comic Relief in the UK. Hi, Richard. Thanks very much for speaking uh, to us uh, today. Um, I wanted to speak to you about Make My Money Matter. So for most people, you're most famous as a director of, of rom-com films, but you've also had this parallel career as a, as a social and, and environmental campaigner and set up um, Red Nose Day and um, Comic Relief in the UK. And perhaps you could explain how these two parallel careers came about. Yeah, I mean, look, initially it started because the the pop music world had done so brilliantly with Band Aid and Live Aid. And it did just occur to me and a few friends that it would be great for the comedy world to make their contribution. So I, in fact, visited Ethiopia, I think in 1985 or six, came back with, a lot of extra passion on the subject. Um, and we did a stage show and then Red Nose Day came about with all the sort of BBC time and selling red noses and everything like that. And that just became, because it went so well, it just became part of my life. And I've always produced the Red Nose Day TV shows. And then that moved forward then into doing Live 8, and then now I work with the UN on the SDG. So it's just been sort of shifting a passion for social justice into different places in my in my life. So then you've made the transition now to sort of environmental and social justice and, and looking at pensions with um, Make My Money Matter. Can you explain how this initiative came about and, and why you felt this was, was the next thing you needed to do? Yeah, I mean, I think there are, a, you know, there are a few things here. Uh, one of which is that uh, in the old days, I remember particularly during Make Poverty History, we didn't deal with the environmental side of things, as it were, climate wasn't part of that. But it, particularly during lockdown, you know, there was so much conversation about race and gender and justice and climate. And the idea that you would somehow keep those things apart doesn't make any sense anymore. The poorest people are the most hit by you know, the thing, the worst things that will happen with our climate. And I've also been an advocate for the SDGs, which again, you know, moved on from the MDGs and linked in climate and justice and poverty. When I've been working with the UN, we always keep saying that in order to fix the world, you need trillions, not billions. And then I just got a whisper. Um, it was actually watching a TED talk by this amazing Dr. Bronwyn King in Australia. And she had this moment of revelation when she's a cancer doctor and she talked to a financial advisor for the first time and found out that three of the top six things in her pension were cigarette companies. And she realized she probably killed more people with her money than she'd saved with her life's work. So that really struck me. And then I found out that the world, the size of pensions worldwide is, I think, 47 trillion dollars and i thought oh this is this is the thing it's actually investment business that huge money which is the whole basis of how the world operates which could be being applied as it were to the best of initiatives to the newest things to things that will make a good difference and then we just honed in on pensions and said in the uk alone it's still 3.1 trillion or something like that it just you know, I didn't realize my pension was invested. I mean, as stupid as that may seem, I think I just thought it sat, you know, in Gringotts Bank and magically, magically grew. That allied with the fact that I think particularly young people are more and more saying, I know there's government, I know there's charity, but what can I do with my own life? You know, and people are looking at them, you know, whether they fly, the food they buy, the clothes they buy, looking at all those issues. And it really struck me that your financial footprint could be the biggest thing 
that affects your carbon footprint. Yeah, I found it interesting in the campaign that you say that changing your where your your money is invested for your pension has a is it 21 times more impact than than going vegetarian or doing lots of these other things which we talk about in the media much more. Um, so is it difficult to get that message out? I mean, is a pension scene as sort of boring and therefore is that why the message isn't getting out? Do you know, oddly enough, I think the message really is getting out now. In fact, I mean, certainly the pension providers, I thought it was going to be a much more combative campaign, but it turns out pension providers were really thinking about this, hearing more from the public about it, particularly young people who take out their pensions, just checking that, as it were, they're sustainable. I hope that it's moved from being a kind of smoky and, as you say, slightly boring thing to a kind of brilliant reveal that you've got this weapon in your armory and and everyone I've ever talked to about it says, oh, wow, well, if I can do that, if I could make one change, I then don't have to, as it were, not eat hamburgers for the rest of my life. Although, you know, it'd be great if people did both. I think sometimes if you say there's something that you thought was dull and had nothing to do with the world and your beliefs, it's actually quite an exciting idea that your pensions and your money and your banking is a resource that you've got. Your campaign is aimed at uh, the general public, the pension funds and, and the government. Is the one area in that which is more difficult to tackle than, than another? The pension bit has been the most exciting. So during the course of the last 18 months, I think a trillion of those three trillion have committed to a net zero pensions by 2050. I think at first the government was worried that we were just a divestment campaign. And there are really complex things about whether you invest in fossil fuels, but campaign at AGMs and everything like that to change the behavior of companies. As always, conversations with government are complicated. And the public side has actually gone pretty well in that actually more and more people are asking those questions, contacting their pension providers. But it is interesting. I thought it was going to be only a public information campaign. But in fact, the other conversations with government and pension providers have been kind of rich and interesting. Pensions are quite a serious matter. And and getting uh, stories of climate change and environmental issues across is often told in quite a serious matter, which turns people off. Do you, do you think there's a role in there for for comedy or humour to to help tell this story and to to change behaviour? Yeah, no, I think, I always think there is. So last Christmas, we did a film with Jason Isaacs where he was pretending to be the CEO of, of Britain's best or worst deforestation company. And he was thanking all the people who were investing in his company for another triumphant year where they've destroyed millions of acres of of uh, of forests. So, you know, that was a slightly comic way of dealing with it. We did a sort of uh, series of ads based on those old Mac ads that um, the, the Robert Webb and David Mitchell originally did. And we had a we had a lovely, young, nice pension called Susan and a nasty pension called Desmond. The great advantage with me is that you're probably already invested in me and I can save you the whole bother of changing. It's not really a great bother changing and it will probably not make you totally happy when you find out that with him, you could be investing in coal. Right. Arms manufacturers. Boom. Gambling. If it's good enough for Ray Winston. Deforestation. What have trees ever done for us? Pornography. Yeah, sorry about that. Do you think we need now more films where environmental issues, climate change, perhaps not pension change, but some of these issues are talked about more as a kind of to normalise and to say, you know, this is what everyday people, everybody needs to be talking about. This is part of everybody's lives. Yeah, I, by the way, I think it's happening is the truth. You're now seeing an increasing number of TV series and films that are kind of predicated on some kind of environmental disaster. Increasingly, that becomes the apocalyptic vision that people are having is of climate having gone wrong. I, I just, just because it's so much on people's minds, I think you're going to find climate is right at the front in all sorts of ways over the next few years. Yeah, because I think it would be good to see it in ways that's not just always uh, sort of the end of the world. And, and it's always a kind of very dark vision. And whether, as I said before, we can't use this in a way where we use humour or 
or a different way of actually kind of it becoming more normalized and there's a positive vision perhaps rather than just necessarily everything being doom and gloom which seems to be the way that film directors presume prefer to deal with it people are really quite willing to think about this in quite a funny way because this idea that you're while you sleep your pension is sneaking around behind your back investing in arms and cigarettes and everything like that i mean comedians are just people and i think that it'll enter you know their it'll enter into the way that you know the world they talk about do you have any plans talking of 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 films to to make anything where you would be talking about environmental issues or climate issues or you know i'm not actually doing much writing at the moment it's quite it's funny you should say because I'm working on a Christmas animation film and, you know, it centers around a terrible storm at Christmas. And we've just inserted a bit which says, um, you know, maybe we should, you know, we should actually say something about the fact that these things are going to happen more and more unless we sort out the climate thing. So I think it's inevitably going to feed into almost anything. You said the government in the UK is is making the right noises. They made a lot of pledges at, at COP26 um, that, about greening the economy, about greening the city, greening finance. Do you feel government is, is moving fast enough to, to help uh, a campaign like yours actually move forward and that both the pension funds and consumers have the tools they need to, to to move their money to where they want to move it. I think it's a very lively conversation with government. It's definitely moved up the agenda. There were disappointments at COP, but also, you know, successes. One of the most interesting things that I feel has changed in the last five years, this is really with regard to the SDGs as well, is the influence of business. You know, I've always felt that it, it's... It, Governments listen to NGOs, but I've always suspected they listen to, listen to business more. And when you get huge companies like Tesco's and Unilever, you know, and Lego making these changes themselves, I feel as though it's it, that that's very that makes it easier for government to feel as though they're not taking some kind of extreme view and then trying to push. They're actually in many cases being led by businesses and in consultation with businesses you increasingly hear it's one of the first things they talk about i'm hopeful that it's an inevitable journey towards legislation government and law all pushing on these environmental issues hypothetically if you had to write something about all this you know how, what would the way of going about it to, to bring the the poverty the climate the the deforestation together you know is the is there a piece of writing, a script, that, uh, an idea that, that, that comes to mind? or I don't know. I mean, uh, when I, I wrote a film about the MDGs, which was all about the negotiations at a G7, it was a film with Bill Nye and Kelly MacDonald, I, I now think if I were doing something, I would come at it the other way around. I would actually have an individual realise quite how much our own lives have to do with what's happening generally. So, you know, we're really encouraging people who work for companies to find a cluster of people and go and see their chief financial officer and say what's happening with our banking, what's happening with our pension and everything. So I've got a feeling that individual responsibility and power, if I was to do anything, might be, you know, the way that I would approach it. And presumably on a long-term basis, a sustainable pension should be more profitable given that com- companies that aren't sustainable are like uh, much more at risk of stranded assets or other problems in the future. Yeah, all, the, all those issues. I mean, it's very interesting. I've had some really interesting conversations with Mark Carney about this. Just as a sort of hard-nosed businessman, you would say the biggest risk to a company is that they're discovered in some kind of, you know, hypocritical position. Um, and that's become the big news story when people have found out that they're not behaving as they would do and indeed long term planning, as you say. I mean, one of the things I love most about this pension ca- campaign is the sort of profound logic of the fact that a pension is something you collect in the future. And if the future is rotten, then a few extra quid isn't going to help you. You want to actually inherit it in a world that is sorted out and is sustainable. So, Super. Well, that sounds like a good place to end as a, a better future than, than the one we're in at the moment. Yeah, you don't want to inherit your pension in a world where you don't dare go outside because there's a forest fire and, you know, 
bad smog. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed this interview, please go to New Statesman's website or go subscribe to our YouTube channel to look at more interviews by environmental leaders. Thank you.